بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله In the name of God, most compassionate, most merciful and I greet you with the Islamic greeting of May the peace and blessings of God be upon you and welcome back to this episode of Life and Faith The wars that destroyed Iraq and Afghanistan the Israeli occupation of and aggression in the Palestinian territories the loss of basic human rights and civil rights in many majority Muslim nations, the mass destruction that is happening in Syria today, and the destruction of its people and infrastructures by various competing interests, the dehumanization that took place and the abuse that happened in Abu Ghraib prison and Guantanamo, these are all acts of aggression and oppression which contravene not only our sacred law but also they contravene and go against international law. And these forms of oppression are more than enough to make Muslims very angry and seriously hurt. And they are more than enough to make people of conscience very angry also and seriously hurt. Anger is a very basic human reaction and any human, be it a Muslim or a non-Muslim, who is subjugated to this type of oppression and aggression, understandably would react angrily, particularly if humiliated and oppressed, as many Muslims find themselves these days. Islam sees oppression as abhorrent and totally prohibited, whether committed against a Muslim or a non-Muslim or whether committed by a Muslim or a non-Muslim. And the prohibition of oppression and aggression is well established in our texts. The very word oppression comes from the Arabic word dhulum. And dhulum has that connotation of darkness. As in the tradition of the Prophet where he says that الظلم ظلمات يوم القيامة Oppression is darkness on the Day of Judgment. In the Quran, Islam's holy text, Allah or God gives us explicit evidence as to why oppression is prohibited. For instance, he says, إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الظَّالِمِينَ God does not love the oppressors. But also he says to us and forewarns the oppressors when he says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ and do not think for a second that God is unaware of what oppressors do. And also he says to us, Indeed, the curse of God is on the oppressors. In the sound tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as narrated in Muslim, the Prophet says that Allah Himself speaks where He says, Ya ibadi, inni haramtu dhulma ala nafsi, wajaltuhu baynakum muharrama. Fala tawalamu, O my slaves, I have made oppression forbidden upon myself, and likewise I have made oppression forbidden among yourselves. Islam defines oppression and dhulm holistically, it does not look at it from one particular dimension. So, for example, worshipping other than God is seen as a form of dhulm or oppression. Theft of people's property, their wealth, their land, their country is seen as a form of oppression. Fraud, cheating, defamation and other forms of aggression such as rape, including also domestic violence. These are also seen as form of oppression. The Quran or Islam's holy text informs us وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا أَمْوَالَكُمْ بَيْنَكُمْ بِالْبَاطِلِ وَتُدْلُوا بِهَا إِلَى الْحُكَّامِ لِتَأْكُلُوا فَرِيقًا مِنْ أَمْوَالِ النَّاسِ بِالْإِثْمِ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Do not consume your property wrongfully, the Quran says, nor use it to bribe judges intending sinfully and knowingly to consume parts of other people's properties. You see, oppression has also been defined as a prolonged, harsh or cruel treatment or control. This precisely described the sustained misery experienced by many people in the world today, especially in the so-called third world since the end of the Second World War. 
And nowadays the gulf between the rich and the poor, as has never been witnessed in human history, is driven by power that controls and oppresses, power that destroys challenging ideas and perspectives, especially those that may expose the grave injustices that shape our modern world. While many of the injustices that fuel the anger and outrage are undoubtedly appalling and abhorrent, and there is no excuse nor justification for oppression of any type of, so, uh, of sort, and they must be resolved. However, we must not forget our sense of fairness and justice in our actions and responses to oppression. As oppression or dhulm is categorically forbidden, justice in Islam is also absolute and not relative. In fact, Muslim scholars agree that justice is mandatory for everyone. It must be applied to everyone under all circumstances, in all places and at all times. Even if a Muslim is an oppressor, then they must be challenged and assisted to stop. And so we mustn't see oppression in one, from one perspective only. And this is exactly what the Prophet advised when he said that you must assist your brother if he is an oppressor or he is oppressed. And to the amazement of the companions who were listening to him, they said, we understand that we must assist him if he's oppressed, but how do we do or how do we assist him if he's being oppressing or if he's an oppressor? He said, by stopping him from committing oppression. In facing oppression, we must never compromise our ethical standards, nor transgress the limits that the Quran or our sacred tradition teaches us. For example, in one of those chapters in the Quran, the chapter known as Al-Anfal, in one verse that sums this idea beautifully, Allah says, وَإِمَّا تَخَافَنَّ مِنْ قَوْمٍ خِيَانًا فَانْبِذْ إِلَيْهِمْ عَلَى سَوَاء إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْخَائِنِينَ here in this verse, the commentators tell us that Allah or God is making it categorically clear to his prophet and his followers that if one with whom you have a treaty becomes treacherous, then you must not lower your standards by reciprocating the same. Treachery cannot be reciprocated with treachery. And oppression cannot be reciprocated with oppression. And injustice cannot be reciprocated with injustice. Why? The answer is given in the same verse. Allah does not love the treacherous. And equally, He does not love the oppressors, regardless of who they are, or under what guise, or under what label they may operate. Ethics and spirituality are the compelling qualities that can prevent us from compromising the essential values and morals of our sacred tradition. We see our sacred tradition as divinely inspired and it cannot become subject to the whims and desires of people. In one of the most st uh, beautiful stories in the history of Islam is one that is narrated by Imam al-Bayhaqi, in which he informs us that during the time of Abu Bakr, the first caliph or ruler of the Islamic world of his time, during which the Islamic empire began to expand. Amr ibn al-As, one of the commanders under Abu Bakr, sent the head of a slain enemy, the severed head of a slain enemy with Uqba ibn Amr to the leader Abu Bakr as a sign of victory. Abu Bakr detested and objected to this behavior Uqba began to justify his actions by bringing the severed head of an enemy to Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, saying that this is what the enemies do to us. Immediately Abu Bakr responded by saying, will you follow the sunnah or the pattern of the Persians and the Romans? We don't follow that. He said, we follow the sunnah of our prophet who never did something like this. Abu Bakr in this case refused to abandon the Prophet's Sunnah or the Prophet's way despite the actions of others. There is no rule for oppression in Islam, whether against an individual such as one's own spouse or children, 
or the occupation and destruction of countries such as Iraq and Syria, or even acts of aggression against non-Muslims, be they your neighbor, or be they the neighbor of your mosque when you come to the mosque and you park your car in the wrong way. Oppression must not lead us to abandoning the guiding principles of our faith. It must not lead us to lowering our ethical standards in ways that can make us ourselves oppressors. For the ends do not justify the means in our faith. Oppression is oppression. Oppression is wrong regardless of who the perpetrators are, regardless in whose name it is being undertaken, and regardless of what label or what shape and form it takes. Thank you for listening.